Thanks, Stu, and thanks, Michael, for the, for the invitation. Um, so we'll be talking about some um, compounds or drugs for um, treating respiratory depression. Uh, no financial disclosures. And this work is currently funded by the NIH and uh, the Department of Anesthesia at MGH. So my talk will have two parts. Um, first part, I'll talk about potassium channel antagonists as uh, breathing stimulants and agents to reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression. And then the second part, I'll talk about some, some more recent studies um, developing or looking at TRH as a breathing stimulant. Okay. So just as a, as a reminder, there's, there's three families of potassium channels, voltage-dependent, the inward rectified, and then the tandem pore channel. And this is the family that, that I work on that I'm interested in. And they're called tandem pore because there's two pore lining amino acid signature sequences in tandem on each subunit. So here and here. And it's believed that two of these subunits come together to form a functional channel. So you can have homodimers or heterodimeric channels. And there, there's 15 human subunits that have been identified. And they, in general, mediate a background potassium conductance. So they, they contribute to the resting membrane potential of cells or neurons, and they control excitability. And I became initially interested in them because several of them are activated by volatile anesthetics. So they may be a, a target for inhaled anesthetics. This, this is a dendrogram showing the, the 15 human members of this family. The, the first one identified was TWIC1. And so we work on task one and task three. And, and, and task stands for TWIC-related acid sensitive K-channel. So these are acidic pH inhibited potassium channels, and they're inhibited in the, in the physiologic range, pK of 7.4 and 6.8. And the crystal structures of four of these have now been solved. So TWIC, TRAC, and TREC 1 and 2. And so that was a huge advance in this field. As uh, Dr. Dahan uh, introduced, the crowded body is, is the peripheral chemosensing organ. It's important in regulation of breathing. It senses oxygen, pH, glucose, and even insulin in the arterial blood. Um, it's not to be confused with the carotid sinus, which has baroreceptor function, which protects you from blood pressure variability. And it mediates 100% of the hypoxic ventilatory drive, as well as it contributes to the, the cardiovascular, the sympathetic response to hypoxia. And so down here is just the, sort of the stereotypical ventilatory response to hypoxia. So with decreasing PaO2, there's this curvilinear response, so you, you breathe more. And there's a linear relationship with oxygen saturation. But it's known now that task one and task three tandem pore channels contribute, they're the, they're the predominant background potassium conductance or permeability in the chemosensing cells of the carotid body, the type one gloma cells. And uh, Keith Buckler and colleagues, he's at the University of Oxford. He was the first guy to show this. Um, he identified an, an oxygen inhibited acidic pH inhibited and anesthetic activated potassium conductance in these cells. And these are current clamp records from this study. So on the y-axis is the resting membrane potential of the gloma cells. And you can see with the application of hypoxia, these cells become depolarized and start to fire action potentials. And that's true for you know, hyper, hypercapnia or increased carbon dioxide as well as acidic pH. And then um, Dong Hee Kim, he's at the Medical College of Chicago. He used some single channel analysis to show that task one, task three, and the task one, three heterodimer are the predominant hypoxia sensitive cells, uh, sensitive channels in the carotid body cells. So, uh, you know, again, the way the carotid body senses uh, hypoxia and acidic pH is inhibition of potassium channels, and they're very likely tandem pore task one and task three channels, but they may also be due to BK or voltage dependent channels. But how hypoxia translates into potassium channel inhibition is still not clear to me. It ultimately leads to depolarization, calcium influx, and then neurotransmitter release. So again, doxapram, it's a, it's a, a ventilatory stimulant that acts at least in part through stimulation of the carotid body. Uh, it was introduced in the 1960s and may have a role, and had a clinical role, in um, reversing CNS and ventilatory depression after anesthesia. It's also been used to treat COPD patients and infants with apnea of prematurity. It's a very low potency drug um, in, the low, in the micromolar range. 
But this led us to the hypothesis then that if, if inhibition of potassium channels is an important step in carotid body chemosensing, then this drug may act by inhibiting uh, these potassium channels when expressed in a heterologous system. And this was work that was published um, in 2006, and that was conducted in, in Spencer Yost's lab back at UCSF. And to test this hypothesis, we injected xenopisoocytes, frog eggs, with CRNA from task one, task three, or the task one, three heterodimer. And we studied their function using the two electric voltage clamp technique. And so in, it's shown in this figure are our current records from the, vet patch clamp, or from the voltage clamp, where the y-axis is current in microamps, x-axis is time in minutes. And you can see with the application of 150, 30 micromolar doxapram, there's a reversible inhibition of these channels. And then, then all these channels, again, are inhibited by acidic pH. So the concentration um, response analysis yields an IC50 of about 400 nanomolar for task one, and then nine and 37 micromolar for the task three in the heterodimer. So then in the subsequent years, um, um, high throughput techniques combined with chemical optimization has identified multiple very potent task potassium channel and, and antagonists. Uh, Merck published on one in 2012 with IC50s of 35 and 300 nanomolar. Remember, doxapram was in the micromolar range. Uh, Sanofi Aventis has a compound, A1899, 70 and 7 nanomolar. And then a KU Johns Hopkins NIH funded screen identified several compounds, and one of them, ML365, had 990 and 16 nanomolar. And there's, there's actually even more compounds that have been identified. So we had a chemist make these for us. This is the Merck compound and the Sanofi. And then doxapram you can buy from veterinary suppliers. It's fairly expensive, but it's still available. And we tested their effects on, on TASP potassium channel function. Um, we, we, it, we transfected an FRT monolayer uh, cell line with TASP3 and studied the potassium channel flux through the monolayer. It's, it's just the way I study these channels. Um, and, and measured its response to these different drugs. And shown in this figure are current records from the Susan Chamber system. This is the zero current level. This is the task current flowing through the monolayer. So you're looking at that potassium current. And you can see with the application of this drug, there's a stepwise decrease in, in, the, in the channel. And so from the concentration analysis, we calculated or estimated an IC50 of 10 nanomolar for, for the Merck compound. 36 nanomolar for the A1899, and then doxapram was you know, three orders of magnitude less potent uh, in the 16 micromolar. So, you know, doxapram stimulates breathing. We just wondered if these drugs were also breathing stimulants. And so to test this, we injected them into a tail vein of a spontaneously breathing anesthetized rat. So these are rats that are breathing isofluorine at 1 mac, 1.5%. And um, we measured their breathing by plethysmography, so we put them in a, a gas-tight chamber, basically. And you can see that this figure is a normalized breathing response, so on the y-axis. And you can see that there's a stable breathing pattern. And then when you inject the Merck compound, five milligrams per kilogram, you get a really nice, robust increase in minute ventilation. These rats are breathing like crazy when you give them this drug. It's, it's impressive. And that's largely due to an increase in minute ventilation, but also their respiratory rate. The other drug, A1899 and doxapram, are not really as potent or, or, and or effective as breathing stimulants. And then here's the, the vehicle control. And this is just the raw signal from the plethysmography chamber before and after drug administration. We also did arterial blood gas analysis on some of these animals. And um, so these, these are rats um, that were also instrumented with a femoral artery catheter. And you can see that, that PKTHPP induces a nice alkalosis at 15 and 30 minutes after giving the drug. And that's due largely to a marked decrease in the PaCO2. So these rats have a, have a raging respiratory alkalosis. A1899 less striking and doxapram even less so. so. And then here's the vehicle control. And this down here is just an anti, this is an intubated anesthetized rat. And you can see, look at the end tidal CO2, and you can see a marked decrease as the, as a, as the animal blows off its CO2. And one bolus lasts for about an hour. So because these are such excellent breathing stimulants, we wanted to know if they would be able to reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression, which would be an obvious clinical use for them. And so to test that, we injected it into intubated rats and it, that had received morphine 
And in these studies, we use a pneumotac to study the rat's breathing. Um, so shown in this figure is a pneumotac signal from an intubated rat. Again, it's breathing spontaneously. It's under isoflurane anesthesia. And when you give five milligrams per kilogram of morphine over five minutes, you fairly predictably get about a 50% decrease in minute ventilation. And you can see when we administer this drug, we reverse some of that ventilatory depression. And this is the signal from a control animal. And then we drew blood gases at baseline in 15 and 30 minutes after giving the breathing stimulant. And what we found is that the drug partially reverses opioid-induced respiratory depression. So in terms of ventilation, it went from 41 in the absence of breathing stimulant down to only 19% depression. And at 30 minutes, it was 48 to 19. The effects on, it decreased the, the effects on PaCO2, and it also improved oxygenation. So there was less hypoxia in the drug and the animals that received the breathing stimulant. So just in summary of part one, I showed you that TAS channels in the carotid body may contribute to regulation of breathing. Doxapram, a breathing stimulant and a carotid body activator, inhibits TAS channels in vitro. PKTHPP and A1899 are potent and selective TAS inhibitors, and they cause marked stimulation of breathing. And then PKTHPP at least partially reverses opioid-induced respiratory depression in rats. So I'll next talk about TRH as a breathing stimulant. And this is, an, is a water-soluble endogenous peptide or hormone. Um, and its structure is shown over here. It's a tripeptide. And it's, it's, N, it's N terminus and it's C terminus are modified. So its carboxylate is amidated here. And the glutamate residue swings around and forms an amid bond to form a pyroglutamyl. So this is actually the C terminus right here. Um, and its endogenous uh, receptor is a TRH G, G protein coupled receptor, which is a GQ coupled or an excitatory receptor. So it's in, in, and I, we became interested in it because it, it, it it's, um, inhibits TAS channels in the brain. Okay. And this is a really heavily studied area with, with, uh, with the TRH compound. There's over 11,000 references in PubMed that, that reference TRH. But it was first identified in the hypothalamus of millions of life, livestock animals, and it stimulates TSH and prolactin solution, uh, secretion in the anterior pituitary. So it has an important uh, endocrine role. But it's also present throughout the CNS, the, the spinal cord, it's in the gut, it's in the pancreas, so it has probably additional roles. But it's an FDA-approved co uh, compound, but no, it's, not really, it's not marketed in the United States anymore. And it was used primarily by endocrinologists in the evaluation of hyperthyroidism, but apparently they don't use it anymore. But as a therapeutic agent, it had a lot of promise because of its neurostimulatory as well as its neurotropic effects. So when you inject it into an animal, it increases breathing, increases blood pressure, increases locomotion. It, uh, it, it decreases anesthesia sleep time by about 50%, which is how I got interested in it. It also um, diminishes some of the hypothermia. And it also may have some analgesic or anti nociceptive properties. So it's really an interesting compound. Um, it's been examined as a potential therapy for ALS, spinal cerebellar degeneration, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, as a, a rapid, for treatment, a rapid treatment of uh, depression, uh, epilepsy, spinal cord shock, um, shock, spinal cord injury, cancer fatigue. And so there's a lot of interest from drug companies with this, with this particular agent. Um, but we know that it's a breathing stimulant. And this was a paper published in 1989 by Schaefer et al. And what they did was they injected two milligrams per kilogram of IV TRH into rodents. And they studied uh, conscious animals as well as anesthetized animals. And what they saw was that there was a, there was a really a, a significant increase in the breathing rate, which lasted about 40 minutes. Right? They also saw a slight increase in blood pressure and a slight increase in the heart rate. So this, this is the figure from that paper where the y-axis is the breathing rate, normalized breathing rate. And um, this is time in minutes. And you can see with the application of, uh, in, with the injection of TRH, there's a nice stimulation in breathing and it goes down. The hashtag here, these are just the 95% um, the confidence window for the the conscious animal. So the breathing effects were a little bit more striking in the anesthetized animal. TRH is also a breathing stimulant in humans. This was a paper published in 1991 by Nick and colleagues. 40, 41 male and, 45 male and female healthy volunteers. They gave them boluses of either 200 or 400 micrograms uh, intravenously. And the drug increased their ventilation primarily by an increase in tidal volume, 
and, but it also increased their res responsivity to CO2. There's a slight increase in heart, heart rate. The side effects were nausea, I think about 50%, uh, dizziness, palpitations, and an increased sense of vigilance. And this is just the flow signal from one of the, their patients from a pneumatac. This is the TRH application here, and you can see a nice increase in tidal volume here. And this is their minute ventilation. Again, about a transient 40% increase in minute ventilation and a slight increase in the heart rate. So we wanted to know, I mean, it's clearly a breathing stimulant, so we wanted to know how good is it at reversing opioid-induced respiratory depression. So to test this, we, um, we took rats and we anesthetized them with isoflurane, intubated them, instrumented them with a tail vein and a femoral artery catheter, and then measured their baseline breathing under 1.5% isoflurane anesthesia, drew a baseline gas, injected morphine, five milligrams per kilogram over 55 minutes, which gives you about a 50% decrease in ventilation. We then administered TRH, one milligram per kilogram, followed by a continuous infusion, and then did a second and a third <coughs> blood gas. And what we found is this drug works really well for reversing opioid-induced respiratory depression. So shown in this figure on the left is the normalized breathing response. This is the morphine-only treated rat, the TRH-only treated rat, and then the morphine plus TRH. And you can see with morphine treatment, there's about a 50% decrease in minute ventilation, which is, minute ventilation is the black bars. And then um, red is the blue dots, and red is the tidal volume. But you can see here's that sort of irregular breathing that Dr. Dahan talked about. With TRH, there's a, there's a slight increase in minute ventilation in the TRH-only animal. Okay. And then in the morphine-treated animal, there's really a, a marked increase in their respiratory rate. They, they, they really take off breathing. And that's, and, but that's also accompanied by a, a decrease in their tidal volume, so it's a very rapid, shallow pattern of breathing, right? But if you look at the arterial blood gas analysis, you can see that morphine induces a, a decrease in, in pH at 15 and 30 minutes, but that's partially reversed by the TRH. The carbon dioxide, the increase, is also partially decreased, but it doesn't really do much for the oxygenation, and I think that has to do with the the much smaller tidal volumes, they may promote, you know, atelectasis or interpulmonary shunting, something. And then the animal treated with TRH only has just a mild respiratory alkalosis. But we want to know how good is this drug, and so we gave these rats a massive dose of morphine. So we gave them a lethal dose. So instead of five milligrams per kilogram, we gave them five milligrams per kilogram per minute, and we drove them into apnea. And rats, their oxygen consumption is about 10 times that of a human, so they don't tolerate apnea at all. They die within a minute if you don't, if you don't get them breathing. Uh, so, and what we found is that it, it, it worked. So four out of the four TRH-treated rats lived, but three out of the three saline control animals all, all died. So again, here's the normalized breathing response. You start the morphine infusion here, boom, they go apneic. We gave them a two milligram per kilogram bolus of of TRH, and it very nicely restored their breathing, very reliably. But again, it was this sort of rapid, shallow pattern of breathing. And then at the end here, we reversed it with Narcan at, at 30 minutes. And you can see there's this, you know, there's this um, surge current at the end. So, so one of the problems with TRH as a therapeutic agent is that it has a very crummy bioavailability. It has a short serum half-life of only four minutes. And it's estimated that less than a percent of uh, systemically administered TRH actually makes it into the brain. And the other, the other problem for prolonged administration is its endocrine effects, the, you know, the thyroid effects and the prolactin effects. Um, but but drug, drug companies have tried to address this. And then a, re, a review of the patent literature in 2011 found 24 different analogs of this you know, reported in the patent, patent literature. So there's a lot of different options, a lot of different flavors of TRH. Um, um, Taltorelin is one of these agents. They have names like Montorelin, Azotorelin, Positorelin. So Taltorelin is one of these agents, and it was um, developed by a Japanese drug company down here. And they, they state that it has the same sort of you know, therapeutic potential as TRH, you know, decreased anesthesia sleep time, et cetera. But it's 10 times stronger, eight times longer, and with 50-fold less endocrine effects. And it's, it's, it's approved in Japan it's also orally bioavailable, which is important to know. And it's improved in, 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 for human use for treatment of spir spinal cerebellar degeneration. That's a, that's a genetic disease that causes ataxia and loss of motor, motor function. But this is a long-acting you know, analog of TRH, and we wanted to know, does it reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression? And it worked actually better than TRH. It worked very nicely. So again, here's the rat that I already showed you, treated with TRH. 
But this is a Talterellin treated rat. Here's the baseline breathing, morphine <coughs> administration, and then a single bolus of one milligram per kilogram of Talterellin. Their breathing just shoots right up. They're breathing well over 200 times per minute. They're like a little machine going. Um, and their, their minute ventilation is, is more than corrected. Um, but again, it's that rapid, shallow, it's that very efficient mode of breathing, lots of dead space ventilation probably. But if you look at the arterial blood gas analysis, um, down here, you can see that the carbon dioxide increase in PaCO2 is completely reversed. The, um, the effects on oxygenation are reversed. Um, one thing that was a little bit concerning was there was a, there was a development of a slight uh, metabolic acidosis, a slight uh, increase in lactate. And, I, and I'm not sure what that's from. This drug is known to increase oxygen consumption significantly. Um, so inhalation is also a, a, is a, is an alternative method for delivering um, therapeutic proteins. From, I mainly just think of insulin as an example. And TRH is known to permeate rabbit trachea in vitro with no metabolism. So one of the, one of the theories is that this may be a sort of a way around and, and, and around for TRH's poor bioavailability. You can just give a big bolus of drug in the lung and then it'll slowly trickle into the system over time. And so we hypothesize that maybe inhaled or intratracheal TRH or talterellin would reverse, reverse morphine-induced respiratory depression. And show, again, this is the rat that I showed you before, and, but these are um, rats that were treated with intratracheal TRH. So this was a single bolus of five milligrams per kilogram directly into the trachea, and it worked. It did very nicely in reversing opioid-induced respiratory depression. So in summary, I showed you TRH is an FDA-approved uh, endogenous tripeptide with a short half-life and poor av availability with neurostimulatory effects. Uh, intravenous TRH and talterellin provoke a marked tachypnea, this rapid shallow breathing, with morphine-treated animals responding much greater than untreated uh, animals. And this is a pattern similar to like with the ampokine drugs that are in development. It reverses even deep lethal levels of opioid-induced respiratory depression. And it has tracheo bioavailability, implying that inhaled therapy may be uh, potential. And I just thank my, my colleagues at UCSF and Mass General um, who have worked on this project. I'm currently working with James and Anita on the TRH project. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have five minutes uh, until the next session. If there are any questions, please uh, step up to the mic. Well, thanks very much for uh, two great talks. Um, these talks are especially interesting in, in the context of the U.S. opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, I want to thank Albert for uh, contributing so much to this area. Uh, a lot of what we understand about it has, has come from your laboratory. I wanted to invite you to collaborate with us if you need to find um, volunteers who are uh, alcohol naive, because we have lots of those in Utah. Um, <laughs> So what I wanted to ask you, Albert, is sort of a, a, a broad question. Uh, how are we to understand uh, opioid-induced respiratory depression uh, in the context of evolutionary biology? Why should opioids depress ventilation? Um, there's the, the natural ligand, and, and it obviously uh, works at the receptor like our drugs do. Is, is it related to a a hibernation response, or why should they depress ventilation? That's a very good point. Um, I've looked at these knockout mice, and we looked at their respiration. Their respiration is a little bit different, but it's really not relevant to, um, to uh, not even comparable to the effect that you see when you, when you compare it to an exogenous opioid. It is true that in hibernation there is an increase in um, specific opioids, but not mu opioid recept, uh, not mu opioids, it's kappa opioids predominantly. That's quite interesting. So it's a difficult question for me to answer. Um, to be honest, I do not know that answer. But in hibernation, it's kappa opioids predominantly. It seems as though that's something we need to think about um, to try to really understand this, because it's obviously a conserved response. So it happens in all animals, I have to say. But it's also quite ironic, isn't it, that we treat ourselves with a drug that's extremely life-threatening, and we self-dose ourselves um, 
irrespective of the effects. We don't care about the effects. We don't care about not breathing. We don't care about that when we treat ourselves. We feel so good. And that's very ironic that on the one hand, you have something that's extremely um, satisfying, gives you an extreme rush, and pleasantness, and we seek it. On the other hand, we stop breathing. Yeah. Maybe it's a punishment. I don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> it's almost uh, biblical, isn't it? Um. <laughs> I, I have just a quick follow-up. I don't want to dominate the mic if there are other uh, questions, but the one thing I want to ask is, you know, obviously it's not just respiratory depression that presents the danger, it's the airway obstruction issue. Um, and it seems there is some evolving information about the fact that these collections of neurons in the brainstem that depress a ventilatory effort also uh, impact uh, the airways, the, the, the muscles that maintain airway patency. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Especially the potassium channel there is extremely of interest because this drug gal 21 was initially developed as a drug to overcome uh, upper airway obstruction in OSOS patients. And um, so this is a secondary effect. And I do agree that uh, potassium channels are involved in this whole process of upper airway obstruction. So yes, but there is development there because I believe that this drug, uh, GAL-021, is much better for overcoming upper airway obstruction than it is to, to overcoming uh, respiratory depression from opioids. Personally, I feel it extremely, well, should I say, um, un understandable why the company stopped developing this drug. And I've, I've even approached a company of buying the compound myself, but they're not really willing to, to release it. I really find this to be ironic. So the, the problem I think we have in the country, uh, more important perhaps than around the operating room, is, is death on the streets from overdose of the, of the drugs. We have uh, lots and lots of folks carrying naloxone, of course, to reverse uh, respiratory depression. And uh, it, it works pretty well a lot of the time, not all of the time. Uh, we have drugs like carfentanil, of all things, being synthesized and injected and a little hard to overcome. And we have re narcotization of patients given the relatively short half-life. Are the compounds that, that you're working on, Dr. Dr. Cotton, I think I'm directing my question, uh, may, might they be useful as uh, drugs that don't need to directly compete for opiate receptor and might they be longer lived? Yeah, that's why we sort of were interested in the, um, the inhaled delivery or we initially started squirting it up the nose, but it's a little bit challenged trying to do nasal administration in a rodent, so which is how we sort of settled for the intratracheal, uh, intratracheal route. But yeah, I know carfentanil, it's, it's it takes multiple rounds of massive doses of Narcan, and then its half-life is fairly long, like six hours, so there's problems with people getting... Uh, going back to sleep after the Narcan revives them and they, and they walk out the door. And so, so yeah, this would, be, this would be an alternative or an adjunct. And, uh, and there is, there, TRH, there is some studies where TRH, at least in humans, has some nasal availability. So that would be a, uh, you know, it, it, can, it can get into the brain through the, the olfactory route. So um, that may uh, be a, a possible uh, use for this drug. Okay, I think uh, time on my uh, phone says it's uh, time for the next session, so I would like to thank both of these speakers. and.